Last January, Congress snuck into a bill, a change to the Service Member Civil Relief Act, and it made a modification to spousal residency rules. And it never was freestanding legislation. It always was legislation that modified the Service Member Civil Relief Act. That's where the law is written. Welcome to the Military Money Manual Podcast, where every episode is all about achieving financial independence in the military faster than before. We believe personal finance shouldn't be boring or intimidating. Building wealth can be simple, and financial freedom is the ultimate financial goal. Now, here's your hosts, Spencer and Jamie. Hey, podcast listeners, Spencer Reese here from MilitaryMoneyManual.com. Today on the show, we've got Kate Horrell from KateHorrell.com, K-A-T-E-H-O-R-R-E-L-L.com. She's an accredited financial counselor, a chartered financial consultant, and a military-qualified financial planner. She's also a military spouse or a retired sailor and a mom of four young adults. She's got a great website set up at katehorrell.com. She's also written for military.com, and she is a wealth of information and knowledge about all things personal finance and especially related to the military, especially related to college. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff on today's episode. And she's so great that we're going to have her back for another episode very shortly. But without further ado, please welcome Kate Horrell to the podcast. So my understanding is that there's been a couple updates to spouse residency in the last couple of years, and especially determining what their state of legal residence is in regards to taxes and where they work. Can you give us a quick kind of what's happened in the last couple of years and what do people need to know today to optimize their state income taxes? It's a great question, Spencer. So last January, unbeknownst to me and pretty much everybody else I know, Congress snuck into a bill, a change to the Service Member Civil Relief Act, and it made a modification to spousal residency rules, and it also changed um, the tax potential tax options for both the service member and the spouse. I'm not going to go over the evolution of the long rules because we'd be here all day, but under the new rules, a military spouse is eligible to retain their previous state of legal residence. Under the old rules, that was only an option under certain circumstances, but under the new rules, they always have that right. As long as they've only moved on PCS orders, Let's say I was a legal resident of California. Let's say I was young. I lived in California, lived there my whole life. I was a resident, married a service member in San Diego, and then we got orders to Fort Hood. Under the old rules, I wouldn't necessarily be able to keep my California residency, but under the new rules, just independent of anything else, a service spouse can keep their legal residence, even if it's not the same as their service member. So this is a big deal. And then the big tax change, and all my tax friends are kind of losing their minds. They're like, they just blew the roof off of the whole thing. Yeah, They changed the Service Members Relief Act to state that both the service member and the spouse can choose which state they want to claim for state income taxes from the service member's state of legal residence, which was true under the old law. The spouse's state of legal residence, which is a whole new ballgame, or the state in which they reside under PCS orders. Now, the kind of loop de loop in this is for military service members, often the primary indicator of their state of legal residence is where they file their taxes or don't file their taxes. So let's say I'm California, my service member is Texas, we get stationed in Maryland, we opt to file taxes in Maryland for some reason. Well, does that now make us a legal resident of Maryland? Huh? Well, that's kind of unclear. I don't know why anybody would take that option. So that's a, a big question. The law also doesn't say that the service member and the spouse have to choose the same state. So hypothetically, one spouse could choose The way the law is written, it appears that the service member could choose to file in their spouse's state of legal residence, and the spouse could choose to file in the service member's state of legal residence. It's kind of a little wild west this year. And then ultimately, this all comes down to state law. 
right? The states have to provide at least as much protection as the federal law says, but they can provide more protection. So the states are trying to amend their laws to be in line with this new federal law, but obviously they don't want to disadvantage themselves. So whether on purpose or just by accident, they seem to be sort of finely defining some things that could get a little tricky. But most states haven't defined anything. Most states have not updated any of the rules. Is that one of your states? You know, they haven't updated their rules online, so there's really no good guidance. You're really relying on your understanding of the law or your tax professional's understanding of the law. It seems to be quite confusing because a lot of the states haven't posted their interpretation. I think that's why there's a lot of debate out there. I'm going to give you two uh, titles that come up sometimes. One is people refer to the Military Spouse Residency Relief Act, which I think Spencer and I have been guilty of calling it that before uh, until I saw you correct the public. And the other one, I think, is the newest one that has the most confusing, I believe, came from the Veterans Auto and Education Improvement Act of 2022, which actually went into law January 5th of 2023. Is that correct, that those are the main topics of confusion? There are Those are two things that are very confusing. There was also an intermediate piece of legislation. This has evolved over three iterations of legislation, the first one being the Military Spouse Residency Relief Act. And as you said, I really discourage people from using ter- that term at this point because that particular legislation is obsolete. It's been overridden twice now. Hmm. And it never was freestanding legislation. It always was legislation that modified the Service Member Civil Relief Act. That's where the law is written. If you go read the Military Spouse Residency Relief Act, all it says is, we're going to go modify SCRA. And then, yes, it is confusing that an act that has the number 2022 in its title actually became law in 2023. <laughs> so these are both areas of a lot of confusion. We can jump into, you know, pulsing the, the tall mood here and, and trying to, you know, determine what exactly Congress was intending when they were passing this. But what I think I want to zoom out just a little bit. And for the average service member family. Let's say, like in your example, we have the California spouse married to the Texan and they're now stationed in Texas. Even if the Californian spouse is working for a California company, but she or he is remote in Texas, they can claim Texas as their state of legal residence and perhaps their HR department has no idea how to process this, so they keep them as a California resident. But when it comes to filing their taxes at the end of the year, they can file as a California non-resident and then claim all that income back and say, no, under the SCRA, I was a Texas resident for that entire tax year, and I don't need to pay California taxes. So I think that's the crazy thing about the situation that we're in right now is, is like you said, it is kind of the Wild West where HR departments and companies don't know how to implement this. But if you have a good understanding of the law, you can go and file your taxes and you can claim the state income tax that you may have paid back and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can backdate this too, right? It's at, at any point in the marriage. Is that correct? You can go. The law does not say when it applies to. Every interpretation I've read says that it is effective for the 2023 tax year. Okay. I would be hard pressed to make an argument that it is for earlier than the 2023 tax year. But if you were a person who wanted to get into a fight with the state government, I mean, that's a fight that it's not crazy, right? Because the law doesn't say. Two other things I want to throw out there just to make sure nobody walks away with misconceptions. Actually, three things. First of all, um, unearned income is almost always taxable where it's earned. In our situations, this is frequently rental property. If you own a house in Nebraska, you're going to need to file a tax return in Nebraska. And even if you don't owe Nebraska any taxes, you probably want to file that tax return number one to establish that you filed it and that you don't owe any taxes. And number two, if you had a loss, you may be able to carry that loss over till sometime in the future to offset taxes that you may owe at some time, you know, when the house starts making money, basically. Second thing I want to point out is that this is an odd place where the service member actually has slightly fewer protections than their spouse, (laughs) because for the service member, it's only their military income. The example, and so any other income they earn, 
earned, again, income, is still going to be subject to taxation where it's earned. And the example I give all the time is, let's say, Timmy Saylor and his um, husband decide that they're going to do DoorDash on the weekend. Well, if the money gets goes in Timmy's name, that's taxable where it's earned. But if the money goes in the spouse's name, it can be attributed to a different state, one of the states that they're eligible to use. So that's an interesting little trick. The third thing is that there are weird nuances to this. And California in particular, I've read a little bit that like they have put out some better explanations, but their explanations don't necessarily jive what, with what any of us think the law actually says. So this is a situation in which you really want to be smart and knowledgeable and understand taxes, or you really want to have a tax professional who gets this stuff. Just a quick note from one of our sponsors, and then we'll be right back to the show. Hey, Spencer, I got a cousin that just graduated from high school, and they're about to start basic training in a few months. Any ideas on a gift I should get them? Yep, sure do, Jamie. The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom, is a concise, easy to read and practical guide to your military money. It's the book that I wish someone had handed me on my first day in the military. In the book, I explain the exact money tactics and investing strategies that can enable you to achieve financial independence while serving in the U.S. military. It's available on Amazon, Audible, and my website. It's hardcover, paperback, ebook, Kindle, and audiobook. You can get a special discount using promo code PODCAST on my website, shop.militarymoneymanual.com. So, Kate, I want to come back to an article that, that you wrote about this topic that I found and just quote exactly the scenarios of what you can choose. And it does start with the quote from the law says, for any taxable year of marriage. So I can see why people may be interested in fighting the backdating question that Spencer brought up. But it says, regardless of the date on which the marriage of the service member and the spouse occurred, the service member may elect to use for taxation purposes any of the following. Um, and Sorry, the service member and the spouse of such service member may elect to use any of the following. It's A, the residence or domicile of the service member, B, the residence or domicile of the spouse, and C, the permanent duty station of the service member. So in my case, we're, my wife and I are both Florida residents. If she earns income in Hawaii, like you said, she's not taxed on it as a Florida resident. But if I'm earning non-military side hustle income, I do potentially owe taxes or at least need to file with, with my state in Hawaii where I'm stationed right now, which is weird. The spouse has more protection, like you said. There's a lot of latitude for the spouses to pick. And I think it makes bean counters and accountants nervous to say that there's latitude because normally everything in the tax code is very black and white. But I think what I'd encourage listeners to do is look at this paragraph of the law, talk to someone if you want. But I mean, if if you are saying that my, I, I'm allowed to choose my residence or domicile of my spouse and my spouse, my military uh, service member is a... Florida resident or Texas resident or whatever, a state that's a little better, not just for military pay. Like California is fine for military pay, but the non-military pay, it's not a great state to be paying state taxes to. So you have the choice. I would encourage you to look at the law and just make sure you can justify why you made that choice. I think the other thing too, because it is the Wild West, is what is your bandwidth to get into a great big fight with a state about this, right? Or to pay a if you're wrong or to pay a fee if, if the court comes back and says you're wrong. I would personally always pick one state and have both spouses file in that state, even if there is a slight disadvantage and there's maybe a little bit away, they're going to come out with a little bit lower taxes. But if it's not super clear that that's 100% legit, I might not want to go that way, but that's just me. Yeah. I mean, I w- the way I would look at this is the risk of audit is extremely low most military service members are not earning six-figure earned income. And if they are, uh, that's fine. But still, like your risk of audit is extremely low until you start hitting like seven figures of, of earned income. And I would encourage if, like you said, if you have an argument to be made, like let's say, you know, in my example, I was stationed in Texas for pilot training. I declared Texas as my state of legal residence. I got married later. My wife also declared Texas as her state of legal residence. We maintained that state of legal residence the entire time I was on active duty. My intention was to reside in the state of Texas upon departing military service. So I have a Texas driver's license, right? Like it's very clear. It's very established that Texas is my state of legal residence. And I have domicile there and I have residence there, according to SCRA. And my spouse can make that argument as well. I think if you can, as a military family, 
if you can establish that kind of legal residence in Texas, Washington, Florida, you know, some state that's not going to tax your income. And you can, like you said, if both spouses are very clear that this is their state of legal residence and you're not changing, you know, year to year as it's convenient, I think you just pick one and, and you stick with it, one that's advantageous. It would be very hard for the IRS or the court to argue that you are gaming the system. And the way that the law is currently written, I think it's very clear. And until it becomes, I, I guess, until the IRS puts out guidance that says, okay, Congress wrote this, but this is how we're actually going to implement it. It's kind of no man's land and you can kind of choose your own adventure until there's more clear guidance. So Kate, there's that really good distinction you made about rental property, for example, in a state where you own a home that's different from the military members pay and that's different from the military members non-military pay and that different from the spouse's pay. A lot of people are also confused in this topic about your state of legal residence. Can you explain how that comes into this conversation, if at all? Yeah. I think that Spencer did a great segue into that, right? So most people enter the military and people confuse the terms home of record and state of legal residence frequently get used inaccurately. But it's easy to see that how that happens because when you enter the military, typically they're the same. So let's say you enter the military in Florida. That's your home of record. It's also your state of legal residence. That doesn't make them interchangeable legal concepts, but frequently people start their career having the same one. And then like in Spencer's case, they get orders to a place that's got more advantageous tax laws and establish residence there, right? And they each state makes their own laws about what it means to establish residence, but generally it means you have a physical presence there. You're going to register to vote. You're actually going to vote. Like Florida, obviously they didn't see what I was voting, but every time I voted absentee, they would scan into their system that that my absentee ballot was received, right? So I was participating in the democratic process in Florida. Get your driver's license, register your vehicles, renew that driver's license in that state, even when it's really flipping inconvenient, because sometimes <laughs> it is really inconvenient, but do it anyway. Because your goal is to be clear and consistent about your intent and to not muddy the waters. Now, two areas that get dicey about this are there's nothing in SCRA that allows someone to obtain legal residence outside the normal channels. It lets you retain your legal residence, but not obtain a residence. So for spouses, it's completely up to state law. I know many spouses who have successfully obtained legal residence in a state they've never actually lived in. Would that hold up in court? Probably not. Is anybody ever going to take them to court? Also, probably not. But you also definitely can't just pick a state. Like I can't live in Maryland and be a resident of Nevada and just declare Florida as my residence. Do people do it? Yes. Do they get caught? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I will give you the example that Maryland has more than once now come back and asked my husband and I to prove that we're Florida residents because we've lived here a long time. We owned a rental property in Maryland. So we were filing Maryland tax returns for our rental property income. And Maryland has come back five years later and said, either prove to us that you were a Florida resident or you owe us $5,000. And they have been really good about, we send them an LES and some pictures of driver's licenses. And they go, oh, okay, fine. You're cool. But if that's not what the LES said, or that's not what the driver's license said, who knows how that would have unfolded. Yeah. So Kate, when you talk about not being able to choose, in the case like, say I'm a Florida resident because of where I was stationed early in my career, I moved to New York, which is a high state tax or high tax state, get married there. The new law does say that my spouse could then become a Florida resident alongside with me, correct? No, it says she can borrow your floor, your residency for taxes, Okay, but it doesn't actually make her a resident. If all I care about is the tax, so kind of true, but not correct wording, but the tax benefit side is available based on my residency being married to a military service member with my residency established, the spouse doesn't have to be in Florida with me at the time I declare my residency for tax Correct. purposes only. Okay. And voting. And again, this is where we get into the circular logic. 
because the law also allows spouses to use um, their service member states for voting. So if I can go to Florida and get a a voter registration based upon my service member being a legal resident there, but voting is one of the primary indicators of legal residents, what happens there? Sometimes it gets very situational. Sometimes it comes down to who's the clerk behind the desk. Yeah. So lots of good things to think about there. I mean, we I've talked to people probably at least monthly who are stationed in a spot like Oklahoma. Hey, do you see yourself staying in Oklahoma long term? Yeah. Like, why are you still paying Illinois state taxes? $350 a month or whatever. We're not telling you what to do with declaring your state for tax purposes or, or whatever, but please look into it. Please read the law and uh, reach out to experts if you need. But in a lot of cases, it's a pretty black and white option for some of our military families, especially for the service member. Yeah, I would say if you're stationed in one of the no PCS to one of the no state income tax states like Texas, Florida, Washington, uh, Nevada, Alaska, you would be hard pressed. I, I, I understand you want to keep your you know New York State driver's license or whatever, but I think you would it would be. How much is that worth to you? Do the math. And a lot of times you do get that money refunded at the end of the year, like Pennsylvania, for instance, um, you have to pay the state income tax throughout the year. And then you file your return at the end of the year and you say, I was a non-resident. It's all military income and they'll, they'll give it back to you. But how much is maintaining that state of legal residence worth it to you while you're on active duty? And oh, by the way, your intentions can change. So if you don't move back to the state that you declared as your state of legal residence after you leave active duty, that's okay. Like intentions can change throughout your career. It's a long, it can be a long 20 year career. It can be hard to determine when you first enter the military, where you're going to end up. I'd like to make a quick plug. If people are looking at this tax situation and thinking they just said so many words, if you put an internet search into Cornell SCRA, the Cornell website is the one that presents the SCRA. It's all the same language, but it's just laid out really logically and you pull up that website and then you click on taxes. And then one of the links is residency for taxes and you can read it. It is not a long piece of law. It is not a unintelligible piece of law. It's actually written very clearly. That may help a lot of people make sense of all of the words that we just said. That's great, Kate. Thanks so much for coming on and talking to us about SCRA, Service Member Civil Relief Act, MSR. RA, Military Spouse Residency Relief Act, and all the various laws that are associated with that. I think this can really save a lot of military families a lot of money on their state income taxes. And I hope people look into this. And um, if it's right for their situation, that they can take some action and save some money on their state income taxes throughout the year. Thanks again. And uh, as always, folks, uh, Instagram at Military Money Manual and podcast at militarymoneymanual.com if you want to reach out to us on email. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Military Money Manual podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Military Money Manual podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in. And we'll catch you in the next episode. The views and opinions presented here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views of the DOD or its components. Reference to any commercial products or services does not constitute DOD endorsement of those products or services.